Hello again. Um, this is, a, is re in a response to a customer who'd asked about the earlier forms of the military and civilian kilt. Uh, but from the early 1700s until 1860s, kilts were, men's kilts were quite a bit different than they are today. Uh, one of them being the length of material. Uh, with the army and the 78th Highlanders, a soldier was annually issued three and a half yards of cloth. There was different lengths depending on what rank you were, what company you were in. I understood that the Grand Deer Company got slightly more cloth. Officers got more, but of course, they were paying a tailor to do it for them. So three and a half yards of cloth, and you went back to the, to the billet, and you found a soldier that actually knew how to pleat the thing. And initially, the things were pleated quite rough. They may not even be pleated in reference to the set. It, it would just be pleated any old way. A little bit later on, by the time of about 1856, and when I learn editing skills, I'll put the photo, the image in at this point, but in the meantime, you can go to my Facebook page, I'll look for the entry where I'm talking about the style of kilt, I'll post the, the photo there as well as the video. By the 1850s, they looked like this. A, this is a three and a half yard kilt uh, with very wide box pleats. Now, if we take a look at earlier versions again, there was there was no rhyme or reason to the pleating. Um, the difference this is this is a modern one that I made for a particular reason. The older kilts weren't as well tailored. Or in fact, they weren't tailored at all. Really, they were just sewn together. There was no lining. There was no canvas. There was no straps and buckles. There was the full width of the cloth, and you can see the selvage edge right off the loom. That's unfraying edge, and they left it like this because. You pleated it up, you wore it for three months, and then at the end of the, that quarter, you unpicked it, and you turned it upside down, and you sewed it up again. Um, another three months, the end of the quarter, they unpicked it, and they reversed it from end to end. So basically what, what happened, because they're wearing their kilts every day for every use, you got first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, fourth quarter, you got four periods of wear out of the kilt. At the end of the fiscal year, the kilt was turned into stores. Stores would make it into trues or tartan waistcoats or pipe bag covers or such like that. And then you got a new piece of cloth. The kilts, now because you needed that, that double selvage edge, the kilts came up very high. The full 27 inches. My finished height for a kilt, as for most men of my height, I'm 5 foot 9, is about 22, 23 inches. That's 27 inches. So the kilt came up almost to your armpits. If you wish a kilt to be tailored absolutely authentically to the period, I can certainly do that. Uh, it'll be held on by two large blanket pins. Um, it'll be authentic, but it, frankly, it's, it's going to look a little funny by today's standards. This is what I've been doing. Again, I made this up um, in reference to a historical kilt, which I'm going to show you in a minute. Three and a half yards of cloth, box pleated to a very wide box. And I've put in canvas and lining and added buckles. So it's tailored, it hangs well. And I believe the reason why these kilts were only three, three and a half yards of cloth, it made sense if you're wearing a kilt every day. This length of cloth means that you have the same amount of cloth hanging off the back as the front. About a yard and a half, a yard and a half, and a yard and a half. So you don't have a heavier back weighing you, you down. Um, it's a little more flyaway, so look, because there isn't the weight. It doesn't, um, it doesn't hang and drape quite as well as the modern kilts, uh, which I'll show you in a second. That, as I said, was made in response to this. The uh, cadets brought me in a, kilt, a pile of kilts to restore. You can see a big pile of them behind me I'm still working on. This thing came to me. I thought it was a tartan skirt um, brought in at the time when the army was trying to um, get the soldiers, get the regiments to allow women to wear kilts. Nowadays, it's not an issue, but it, it was a problem. It stuck in people's throats then. But I took a look at it, and I, everything about this kilt, the materials, the quality and style of workmanship, everything about this kilt to me says World War I. And I believe, because that there was a shortage, a crisis shortage of tartan and kilts in the fall of 1915. And frankly, the soldiers were getting killed so fast that the sheep couldn't even grow the wool fast enough to replace. It's horrible. So. Our recruiting was suffering because the soldiers, people weren't, weren't going to enlist and wear trousers. They wanted the kilt. Various ideas came, were put forward. One of them was a khaki kilt made out of the same material as the coat of the time. 
enormously unpopular. Um, from the workmanship and everything else, what I believe this to be, and I don't know how I could ever actually prove it conclusively, what I believe this to be is a kilt made in response to that kilt shortage by a kilt maker who would have been about my age at the time, late 50s, and in response to this crisis shortage of kilts, he produces a garment in the manner that he'd been trained in the 1850s, 1860s. Maybe he's in the 60s. My, my math is terrible. Anyhow, so there we are. That's a interesting little historical document. Now, after 18, 1850s, because we have pictures of the 78th Highlanders in Montreal and Halifax wearing kilts essentially identical to the way the Sea Force wear them today, of seven and a half yard box pleated kilt. I don't believe that the box pleat was deliberately introduced for military kilts because in, and I'm just old enough to remember in my day as a soldier, when you got off duty for the day, you spent, you were frantically busy until lights out, polishing, cleaning, repairing, pressing your kit for the next day's inspection. No soldier voluntarily brings work on himself. And kilts in those days were made in-house by the regimental tailoring cell. I believe that a kilt, because I found out from making one of these things, that if you sew a kilt in a knife pleat and you don't do anything else, no canvas, no lining, anything else, and you wear it, it starts to become a little bit box pleat as the material shifts. You press it and bam, you've got a box pleat kilt. I believe and I'm not sure again how I could how I could prove this unless somebody's an, a, a, as yet unknown diary soldiers diaries out there. When the British Army was in India, which is where the 70th Highlanders, later Second Sea Fourth, spent much of their service, they had barrack servants, um, and those people did everything. I remember my grandfather, uh, who'd served in India before the First World War, even in great old age, marveling how. He'd woken up in barracks to find his, he, that he'd been perfectly shaven in his sleep. I know. Scares the bejabbers out of me, too. Old guy, shaky hands, straight razor. Good night, sweet prince. Um, but their kit was all done for them. And that's the reason why, really, we have the incredibly high standard of dress department we do today. Because they woke up, their boots were shone, their stuff was pressed. I believe that a, um, a dobiwala, a, a, a close... Um, a cleaning man, one night had pressed everybody and it's still 15 minutes to Revali and his iron is still hot and Private Ptolemy Sub's kilt is laying there just dying to be pressed and he pressed it and it, as I said, the, the, if, you don't, if you make these things without pressing them, they, they tend to sort of become a little bit box pleat in, in their construction. So I, I believe, informed uh, opinion, that the Dobiwala pressed the, to, or whoever the soldier's name was his kilt. That soldier possibly won, let's say, best rest of the day because there was something new and sharply dressed about his appearance, and other soldiers wanted it. It's, it's conceivable. It's consistent with the facts as we know of the history of the British Army in India, and frankly, some stories are too good to spoil by doing research. So there we are, a somewhat rambling and disjointed account of the differences between the three three and a half yard kilt and the seven and a half yard kilt. I believe that the reason why the seven and a half yard kilt came in was even though the army was wearing them every day, not, not everybody else was. And therefore, they, they, by doubling the size of the fabric, you got a garment which was heavier, but it drapes better and it moved so much more interestingly uh, when, you were, when you were walking. So there we are, and there we have it, and thank you.